Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Coin Brief Podcast. This is episode number 23. Coin Brief is your open source for digital currency news. And uh, every week we talk about the latest uh, developments in the Bitcoin and cryptocurrency space. This week we are going to talk or start with discussing the recent price movements uh, this week of Bitcoin. So we're in the middle of November and on the on the on November 12th, we had this huge uh, price rise in Bitcoin. Some technical thing happened, like a Mac a 1D, MACD crossover or something that I don't really understand, but people on Bitcoin markets understand it. It crossed over, which is a very bullish indicator. And we the price started out around $345, and from there really rose $100, basically in one day. So once we had that technical um, uh, reason for the crossover, it unleashed like a bullish frenzy, like a temporary bullish frenzy. Uh, someone bought a ton of coins on OKCoin, like literally a ton, <laughs> like, you know, thousands. And um, so that pr- sent the price skyrocketing higher. And we reached a peak of $445, at which point um, I know I saw the price on my Bitcoin um, chart app on my phone and uh uh i was i was like man is this this is nuts this is rising way too fast um and i should have i should have sold because i I thought that it rose too fast and it it did we had another drop back down to the 370 380 range so um yeah pretty interesting um market activity this week yeah it wasn't exactly gentlemen quite yet yeah (laughs) not yet this is not yet soon. gentlemen. <laughs> um, well, I I pretty much saw the the you know the fall coming you know f- you know following the huge skyrocket because like you said it was just way too high and way too fast for it to be something real and then I found out uh, today actually I saw some people on Reddit saying that it was one single person on OKCoin who bought a bunch of coins on that day and um, so that makes a lot of sense and it was even more evidence favoring my opinions on uh, technical analysis because I read this one saying, oh, Fibonacci sequence, MACDs, EMAs, blah, blah, blah. Uh, the, and he basically concluded by saying, um, it's almost inevitable that the rally will continue to $500 and stay there. Uh, and then that was, I read that the day before yesterday, or the, the article was from the day before yesterday, and I read it yesterday. And as I was reading it, the price fell below 400 um, And this was after I was already thinking to myself, I was, I was piecing together, like, looking at the recent events, like the change tip going viral, and, mm-hmm. and uh, what else, a oh, Silk Road. Uh, Silk Road, for, yeah. For yeah. some reason, when Darknet markets get busted, everybody wants to buy Bitcoin. I have <laughs> yeah. no idea what the connection is there, but I was... So when it started going up gradually, I was like, okay, well, it's, well, those are the that's the reasons why. And then it, it spiked up, and I was like, well, there's, it's going to... At some point, that's going to correct itself. And sure enough, it is. And I will not be surprised at all if we return to, you know, 345... 350 really? range within the next couple of days. Wow. Okay. Uh, I mean, the change to going viral and the interest over or the excitement over Silk Road getting busted again, that might, you know, keep it a little bit higher. But ultimately, that's just temporary excitement. Like, change to probably isn't going to be viral forever. Um, and yeah. Yeah. There people, was a spike people, for, for like a few days. Yeah. People will get over Silk Road. And so then, uh, we have to keep in mind that there's constantly this never-ending selling pressure from miners and merchants. So mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. any any kind of like bullish activity we see, it's being put on top of, of that huge amount of selling pressure. And so and and less unless the, the bullish activity is enough to, you know, indefinitely cancel out that selling, it's just not gonna last. So, you know, for the foreseeable future, we just have to say, well, it's probably going to 
keep going down or like stay flat for a while until something huge happens. Yeah. Um, so, you know, there's, there's bullish, there's bullish, um, reasons to, to look at this and then there's, there's bearish reasons. Um, I, you know, talking about one of the bearish reasons, the, the, um, the merchants exchanging their bitcoins for cash and BitPay and Coinbase helping them do that. In in the past, I've you know harped on about this issue constantly and saying that this is what I think is is selling pressure on it. But you know, at the same time, we're we're reaching into a point you know late 2014 where I think that people are starting to get used to the fact that all these merchants do accept Bitcoin, and I think we're if if not already then pretty soon we're going to see a point where there's going to be equilibrium reached uh, between the merchants and the, and the buyers who are, who are buying Bitcoin. Um, it's, I don't think it's going to be a bearish indicator uh, for eternity, for sure. Um, it'll just uh, stop impacting so much uh, once we reach equilibrium. Um, as for the other thing, uh, mining, you know, mining centralization and the fact that it's so expensive to run a mining farm now and those people have to sell their coins relatively quickly to pay for electricity costs, you know, land use costs, whatever goes into these mining farms that are mining, you know, hundreds of thousands of bitcoins a day. That's probably an overestimation, but, you know, they're mining a lot and they're exchanging it for fiat. That, I think, is a more bearish indicator than the merchants exchanging for Bitcoin. But, you know, we've got to let this all play out over the next few weeks and see what happens. Um, the bullish things, like Silk Road getting take down, taken down, I think that for some reason that uh, motivates some institutional investors because they see that it, it, like Bitcoin has a little bit more legitimacy now that there's not as many darknet markets that are you know, selling drugs and illicit activity and all these things, even though that that is a huge part of the economy. And it's, in my opinion, um, a valid part of the economy and should be legalized. Um, there are some people out there, investors who are like, oh, wow, this appears more legitimate now. I'm going to dump, you know, uh, a few thousand more dollars into this at least. So I think that that's that might be what kind of impact that Silk Road has on it. Um, but like how all these things play out and, and how they balance against each other, um, that's that's what puts us up at the current market price, really. Yeah, I I think I think the the merchant thing will continue to be bearish for a while. I mean, as as long as as long as merchants are cashing out faster than people are buying, uh, then that's going to put down pressure on the price. Uh, but you're right. At, I mean, at some point, either, either because people stop spending as much, or because uh, merchants, you know, come up with a reason or a way that they don't have to cash out anymore, then it'll kind of it'll kind of level out a little bit. But until then, it's definitely going to push the price down, um, or it'll it'll at least create like a a baseline of selling pressure and demand has to be and for bitcoins has to be above that to keep the price from going down mm -hmm. and i think that's going to happen for you know i don't know i can't i don't know when it's going to end you know maybe maybe in a month everybody will be paid in bitcoin but i highly 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 doubt that yeah, I, I think that'll take a while i think merchants i think merchants are going to have to um sell their coins for a while and uh, miners will constantly dump Bitcoin on the market until uh, until they have to give up mining because because it becomes unprofitable, or yeah. um, or one or of them the supply, gets burned down or something again. Yeah, one of them catches on fire and they stop mining, or the supply gets halved again. That's going to happen at some point. I'm not really sure when. And then I think uh, that's going to happen in like 2016 or something like that. So okay, and then well, when that happens, they won't. There won't be as many mined, obviously, so they won't have as many to sell, made them, and then they'll get more valuable. Um, but even then, they'll still have to sell a lot of Bitcoin to pay for their electricity because then their costs will go up when the yeah they're still going to be selling so. probably the same amount in order to pay for electricity as long as the electricity providers don't accept Bitcoin at that point. Yeah, uh, but you know, but, there's just going to be less to sell. Really, there's going to be less inflation of the overall money supply. Yeah. 
yeah so i think definitely i'm still i'm still totally a long-term bull on bitcoin i mean bitcoin's gonna take over the world obviously it's inevitable but mm -hmm. right now right now the price is gonna go I don't want to say it's going to go down, but it's not going to go up for a while. I don't think we're going to see $1,000 again anytime soon is what I'm trying to say. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, you know, w one other thing that's kind of bullish uh, for Bitcoin specifically, and that also happened around the same time as the price rise, uh, was that the counterparty developers came out and announced that they had built um, code that can run Ethereum Ethereum-like smart contracts uh, directly into Counterparty, which is on the Bitcoin blockchain. So, like, <coughs> you know, people invested a total of $15 million into Ethereum a couple months ago, uh, you know, to get the first share of the coins that are made from Ethereum. But now it looks like, theoretically, we will be able to run those smart contracts directly on the Bitcoin network using um the counterparty system so uh what do you what do you think this uh means for like you know ethereum overall like does this make ethereum a little bit more irrelevant i know it's still going to be probably a successful system but the fact that you don't necessarily have to buy into it to get those features out of out of cryptocurrency overall uh that's that's pretty huge for bitcoin and counterparty i think First off, I don't really know much about how Ethereum or Counterparty works. I understand that it's smart contracts and Counterparty is working on like decentralized stock exchanges based on Bitcoin and stuff. But um, like, I, if they, I mean, if they do, if they do the same thing, if they do the exact same thing, which I I can't say because I don't really know much about either one. But if they do the exact same thing, then yeah, this Counterparty development um, will make. I think it will make Ethereum um, a little, you know, it'll make it less use, uh, useful because um, who's going to want to trade their super valuable Bitcoins for some, you know, like really not that valuable Ether just so they can have a smart contract when they can use like however much it costs to lock in a smart contract on Counterparty on top of the blockchain. Uh, and they don't, there's, it takes a step out of the, out of the process you don't have to like your bitcoin to a different currency or whatever yeah. and take on so, all that risk yeah but i mean ethereum ethereum is no doubt still really important because they're the ones who came up with the idea yeah you know would would counterparty have been able to do this if they if Ethereum didn't do what they did, because Counterparty just took Ethereum's code and like changed it a little bit, added to it so it would fit onto the blockchain. So Ethereum is definitely incredibly important because that was a big step forward into Bitcoin yeah. 2.0, as people like to call it. So it definitely Turing, doesn't. Yeah, Turing complete smart contracts, um, which you know I'm not totally informed on this on this concept, but I think that basically Turing complete means that you can. You can run really, really advanced um, contracts, and also it's it's guarded from uh, you know attacks, spam attacks, because of the built-in counterparty fee system. So like these really advanced contracts for I mean setting up any kind of financial instrument that you can possibly imagine, stuff that you know probably Wall Street hasn't even thought of yet. Um, ways to transfer ownership of assets, ways to uh, create crazy programs that that manipulate assets in, in different ways so now all of this was going to be like killer apps for ethereum reasons to buy into ethereum to use that system but now the killer app has been copied <laughs> as, as is possible with with code these days this crazy future that we live in um this great innovation can just be copied and, and copied onto the original bitcoin blockchain using the counterparty system. It's really amazing, I, I think. Yeah, but that's what um, that's what a lot of people have been saying about all these altcoin projects. They've been saying, well, they, they... But unless they do something that is, like, completely unheard of, it 
we can just take the new little improvements that they made and import that into Bitcoin. Right. And I think it was Gavin Andreessen a while back made a blog post somewhere, uh, not on the Bitcoin Foundation. It might have been like a personal blog or something. And he wrote about what he called Bitherium. And it was putting Ethereum on top of Bitcoin where Bitcoin would be the main currency of the system and then the Ethers would just be like not currencies, but they would just be like tokens to sign contracts with. And that's basically what Counterparty has turned Ethereum into. So yeah, I think G- Gavin Andreessen was definitely right there. That was definitely, you know, I think his prediction is going to come true. And I think a, a lot of altcoin projects are going to, and if they're valuable enough, if they are a big enough improvement over, you know, vanilla Bitcoin, I guess you could call it, then it'll be in, it'll be put on top of Bitcoin, and even yeah. more so now with side chains. Yeah. So, but yeah, Counterparty definitely. That was definitely a pretty big move, I think. If if smart contracts really take off anytime soon, you know that's. Um, yeah, it's it's right. still a really fertile ground that no one's really actually made a killer app w- with smart contracts yet. It's just that we're like, oh, well, now we have the ability to make smart yeah. contracts, like, but what like are people going to build with it? Yeah, like we can, we're we're able to do it. They we're able to do it with Bitcoin now. So if, if it actually takes off, then it'll, it'll be a huge thing. And um, but back to the original question, I think it will make Ethereum less useful, but that. That do- that doesn't in any way like diminish their importance because they were the ones who came up with the idea in the first place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know they still they still have that fifteen million dollars in Bitcoin that they raised. Yeah, they still have a bunch of money. So what are they going to do with that? Yeah. Maybe now maybe they might partner up with Counterparty and they can together. On that would be pretty crazy. Ethereum. Yeah. So, but like it's it it's great that they're competing with each other as well because this is kind of like. We're seeing the free market economics kind of replicated a little bit in the development community for cryptocurrencies. Like we're we're seeing these developers innovate in these crazy ways, creating you know new smart contracts and, and ways to manipulate finances. And the other guys are like, oh wow, you made that cool thing. We can make that too. <laughs> we'll 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 copy you and then put it into our own system. And it's fine. It's open source, so there's nothing wrong with it. And you know, everyone is innovating on top of everyone else's ideas and like just, you know, give this another five years and people are going to create some really crazy applications just by competing with each other and to see who can make the best product. It's actually a really good example of how intellectual property actually um, hinders innovation because everybody... Even even libertarians who believe in intellectual property, they they say, well, it encourages innovation because if you don't have any intellectual property and somebody can just take your idea as soon as you come up with it, um, then there's no profit motive there because it's impossible for you to make profit. Well, well, and that's not true because there are various ways you can protect your project and make a lot of money on it before other people can get a hold of it. Mm-hmm. Um, but also it shows how a lack of intellectual property can spur innovation just as much, if not more, than you know things like patents and copyrights that create these unnecessary monopolies on ideas. Because counterparty, literally, they copied, they took the Ethereum code and they changed it to make it fit to what they were trying to do. And then they were able to put it on top of Bitcoin blockchain. Can you imagine how long it would have taken for Counterparty to do that if they had to build a program from scratch that didn't violate any kind of copyrights or patents that yeah. Ethereum had on their on their source code? It might not have even happened because it might have been just way too hard to build something completely original to do something similar to Ethereum. Yeah, and they'd and then, be terrified of a lawsuit coming at them if they infringe yeah, on even and, a little bit of the intellectual property. And then, and so then, the only people who'd be working on this would be Ethereum. And right now, they're just like you know, basically a pretty insignificant altcoin. Nobody knows if they're actually going to do what they what they say they're going to do, because altcoins have been known to do that. They have, you know, have this IPO and then disappear with all the money. Yeah. So. It's definitely, I think it's definitely a great example 
of why intellectual property is just totally unnecessary and uh, and the absence of it actually spurs growth and innovation. And we can see that with the open source movement going on in the crypto community. Yeah, yeah. And like imagine if imagine if Ethereum had the, the legal standing to like sue counterparty in court over some intellectual intellectual patent that they made, you know, a year ago when they first thought up Ethereum or whatever. Like that you know, that not only does that restrict the freedom of the of the competing um, organizations and developers, but also like it just creates costly inefficiencies in the whole like ecosystem because then in in instead of like everyone putting their funds and their efforts towards the actual development of things they're paying lawyers fees and and you know court costs and all that stuff just to be able to to either on the suing side you know protect their monopoly or on the defending side to to get permission to innovate basically instead all those costs are going into a stupid court system so like that's that's a that's a great part of this ecosystem that there's no you know, real intellectual property going on, r restricting people in that. So, and it doesn't it doesn't necessarily even hurt Ethereum either. That county counterparty did this; that they took their idea and made it better, or m making it better is debatable. But they took the idea and put it into Bitcoin, copied it because, into Bitcoin. Yeah, because didn't you 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 were telling me about um, about Vitalik did something like to get back at counterparty or something, and they. Like they took something from Counterparty and put it into Ethereum. Yeah, yeah. I was going to mention that. Um, yeah, basically Vitalik, uh, the genius that he is, the guy who, who created Ethereum, he saw that you know Counterparty p copied Ethereum onto their platform. Well, he uh, copied the Counterparty system and wrote the code for that uh, that can be run in Ethereum. So then we have it going both ways. And, and like now people are commenting on Reddit, like what if you could run counterparty on the ethereum platform and then run ethereum within the counterparty platform within <laughs> ethereum <laughs> it's crazy yeah. and and it's it's some it's interesting because uh, um like I said, it doesn't necessarily even hurt Ethereum because they di they did it to you know maybe spite Counterparty or to like get back at or you know make poke fun at them or something. But they they could have potentially by doing that they could have potentially made Ethereum better as well. Yeah, yeah, so exactly. E either either way, no one really lost because Ethereum could still profit off theirs. Uh, Counterparty made Bitcoin better, um, and. It took something from counterparty to make ethereum better maybe i don't know exactly what they did but uh they they could do something like that and there's no like there's no friction there there's you know there's no like, legal friction right. that yeah. prevents any of that from happening uh, and it doesn't hurt anybody because i mean ideas aren't scarce so there's no reason why they should be uh artificially monopolized yeah and like i see I, I see nothing but win for everyone involved yeah Especially the regular people who are just watching from the sidelines and who are eventually going to be basically consumers of these products that come out, you know, once Ethereum is released, once Ethereum is truly functional within the counterparty platform and easy to use. Like, we're the ones who benefit the most from all this. Like, people are, comp these developers are competing to make these great apps, and then we get to use them in the end. So, like, in in this crazy you know financial electronic future that we're going to be living in you can choose which blockchain you want to buy into and like maybe depending on, it won't really matter which one you buy into because each one's going to have pretty much the same features depending on yeah, if the developers are good enough might even be interchangeable really yeah yeah well that's basically what side chains are on on the bitcoin blockchain it's going to be um the two-way peg <laughs> system is going to allow you to change funds um, directly from the Bitcoin blockchain, lock those, and then in exchange, uh, get a certain amount of tokens for whatever side chain you're buying into, and you won't have to go through any central party for that. And then side chains will be able to do basically any altcoin thing that you can think of: faster transaction times, um, different different mining algorithms, you know, side chains with proof of stake system. Uh, so, like, and that can just be done directly from the Bitcoin blockchain. 
like these are these are pretty new developments that have happened in the past couple months like we're like wow you can ba basically get all of these features potentially on a single blockchain and there's a lot of people who are pushing for bitcoin to be that central you know main blockchain to hold all of these features it's pretty exciting i hope these applications actually end up being valuable in the future people actually use them because um the technology involved and the engineering involved is way over my head but it seemed it sounds pretty cool so hopefully they'll actually be useful in the future and everybody's work will pay off but yeah i mean down with intellectual property and it makes the world a better place yeah um speaking of open source uh projects and amazing feature tools for transacting Open Bazaar Beta has entered version 3.0 of their beta program, and now it's available for Windows platforms, so uh, Windows users can join in on all the beta fun of managing managing their own Open Bazaar storefront. Uh, you know, just trying to make make a make a new marketplace basically that's open source that cannot be taken down uh, by by law enforcement or any central administrator or anyone who controls the servers or anything. So we're seeing Open Bazaar progress at a pretty good pretty good pace. And you know, eventually if Open Bazaar utilizes its full potential, we're gonna see an easy to use marketplace that can just run directly on your computer. Your computer is part of the network that maintains everything in a distributed decentralized manner. And freedom, boom. Yeah, I was I was surprised when I um, when I saw that it was actually beta 3.0. They're moving really fast, aren't they? Yeah, pretty much uh, like one version a month, really. And a cool, just a cool little uh, factoid about it is uh, for on on the blog post announcing the 3.0 release, they they said that. Uh, from now on, we're starting with 3.0. Um, every release is going to be named after a famous bazaar from around the world. So that's pretty cool. Yeah. The first one is called Tarbiz, which is apparently some market in Iran, and it's the oldest, one of the oldest bazaars in the Middle East. That's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. Tabriz. I'm excited to see what it turns into, what um, Open Bazaar turns into. I hope a bunch of stuff gets sold on there. You know, drugs, porn, clothes, food, everything. I, I just want to see all this like stuff for sale for Bitcoin, and nobody has any control over it except for the people involved in the transaction. Because it's really amazing to me, and yeah. I hope it. I want to see it really take off. Uh, I think it'll be really awesome if it does. Yeah, it's a huge experiment. It's a huge experiment that has never been implemented in any practical way before. Uh, Silk Road was the very first f totally free market where anything gets sold, but uh, it was hampered by the fact that it's on a central server. Uh, law enforcement can find that server. They apparently have that ability, as we saw in the recent Darknet busts. They have the ability to find these servers, whether through like, you know, be running their own Tor exit nodes and analyzing the data that goes through there, which is a theory that some people have is how they're finding these people. Or in most most cases, just going through hu human error and finding the server that way, which is what happened to the Silk Road yeah. 2.0 guy. Like but people it, were registering their servers with their real names. <laughs> Blake at Benthal.net. <laughs> yeah, good job, good job. But if if it's all on a distributed network, then there's no server necessary. Period everyone on the network is is running their own basically version of the marketplace and they all work together to to maintain it basically how the bitcoin blockchain works although open bazaar is its own separate network and they'll just be using bitcoin for the transactions pretty exciting let me ask I... you this uh, do you do you think that open bazaar once it's fully functional and up and running and we see all these you know items for sale and all that is it is it a bullish indicator for Bitcoin overall? Do you think that's a buy for Bitcoin? I don't. I don't know if it's so much if it's really a good sign for Bitcoin as it is for it's just a sign for 
liberty in general. Um, it'll be it'll be definitely no doubt about it. It'll be a huge blow to the drug war. Um, I don't I don't think I don't think anybody uh, is go is going into this thinking that Open Bazaar will have no drugs on at all. That's probably right. going to be the first thing that's sold on Open Bazaar. Uh, we know there there's one porn star that's already selling her uh, her custom videos on there or something, but once once it goes live, once it gets out of beta and it and it goes live, you know, uh, of course, one of the first things that's going to be sold on there is going to be drugs. So, yeah. and it'll be totally decentralized. They they won't be able to take it down. Of course, they'll be they'll be able to arrest people by tracking down packages getting sent to houses and things like that. But they won't be able to take down the marketplace itself. Yeah. So I'm thinking more along the lines of. Um, getting around uh, restrictions or the terms on which things can be sold. As far as Bitcoin, I I don't I don't know because I can't really see Open Bazaar right now within you know like the first few years bringing anyone new into Bitcoin mm. because I I can o- I really only see people using open bazaar in these early stages uh they're people who are already involved in the bitcoin community so i yeah. can't i can't really imagine it um significantly increasing demand for for bitcoin um in in the i mean in the, in the early stages at least yeah yeah um like it, the way that they would really make this thing blow up and, and be like a huge cultural shift really is by you know making it so easy to use where it can just be an app on your phone or a program that you install from an exe file on your windows or a dmg file on your mac or whatever it is and have a beautiful user interface that basically anyone can use and the only technical know-how they really need is getting the Bitcoin in the first place and transferring it to their open bazaar address to go shopping which with is it. becoming easier and easier yeah, yeah. Uh, like right now, it's just uh, you have to use it by using the command line uh, terminal on Mac and, and making sure that your, your connection is right and all that. But like it's, it's functional, though. It's functional, and people are actually making uh, transactions on it. But like if they, like a year from now, if they turn this into an easy to install app on, on your Android phone or your iPhone, um, it's game over for eBay. Game over for all these other regulated marketplaces, because it'll it'll be cheaper, it'll be more fun to use, in my opinion, and probably other people will think that as well. And I, I think that you could really as- attract mainstream uh, attention to it. I don't I don't know if that would be a bullish indicator for Bitcoin. There's some people in the community who do think that that would be a a bullish thing for Bitcoin to have this marketplace up and running and easy to use. But uh, It'll be interesting, uh, at the very least, to, to see what what kind of cultural shift might be sparked by having this easy to use, decentralized, reliable um, marketplace with reviews and reputation systems and all that, r- right there, like on your device in front of you. Yeah, I don't. Like I said, I can't really see a co- the connection between. Um... Open Bazaar and Bitcoin, and unless of course it gets mainstream enough to where people are buying Bitcoin just so they can use Open Bazaar, uh, which would obviously be the case if it if it hits if it hits mobile platforms and becomes popular. Yeah, people will be buying Bitcoin like crazy so they can shop on Open Bazaar. Imagine just going on your Circle app, buying twenty dollars yeah. worth of Bitcoin, transfer it instantly right there on your device to Open Bazaar. Super. But easy. what I think. What I think would be really huge, talking about cultural shifts, what I think would be really huge is if it started, Open Bazaar started coming pre installed on new computers. Because I, I think cause that would be super convenient because it would already be on there. You just click on it and launch it. Um, my, my reasoning behind it is that uh, eBay, you can just get on the internet and type in the, the address ebay.com and go and shop uh, with open bazaar you actually have to commit to installing the software learning how it works and things like that and 
at first, uh, at the onset, right now in the early stages, the only people who are going to be willing to actually spend time installing a program are people who are already invested in Bitcoin. Yeah, but and part if, of the tech community and all that. But if it gets popular enough to where everyone wants to use it, uh, then I think it would be a huge thing if it came pre-installed on on new computers like you know internet browsers are. It, you yeah. you just buy you just buy a computer from you know an electronics store and you, you turn it on you you pick out the software you want with it you turn it on when you get home and, and open Bazaar is there yeah. or if you're if you're a Linux user you download it or get the live CD and it's just prepackaged with the with the OS I think that would be pretty huge yeah I think that Linux is the only operating system that I can really conceive of that would ever like include open bazaar as part of their platform you know apple apple and windows including open bazaar in in their os like these guys don't even want to include firefox in their os and firefox is a very established reliable browser that you know macs have safari and they don't even include chrome and and windows includes uh, internet explorer i haven't used a windows machine for my personal use in a long time, I don't even know if they include any other browsers beside Internet Explorer at this point, or whether it's even reliable anymore. So, like, maybe if maybe a few years down the line, if Open Bazaar gets like a lot of legitimacy, somehow, I mean, like, why would they why would they include a browser or a, a marketplace on their machine that they know is being used to sell drugs, large quantities of drugs? And like, hey guys, here's an easy way to buy drugs. We're gonna include this on in the next uh, MacBook. I mean, it'd be uh, it'd be hilarious, and, and I, I would do it if I was the CEO of Apple. I'm just saying. But it'd be okay. it'd be cool though. It'd be cool though if it got if it got popular enough that you know maybe like five or ten years down the road, it would just come pre-installed on your computer, and it'd, it'd be like a word when you turn the computer on. Because yeah. I I just see it as if we're trying, if it ever, if we ever try to market it to the mainstream, I just see it as kind of an inconvenience because you have to actually sell people on it, so they'll, so they'll, you know, install it. They'll yeah. dedicate their time to installing it. Yeah, that's not going to happen for a long time. I think that even once it's really up and running, and even when it's easy to use and easy to install uh, for people, like even then it's going to stay in like an underground phase for a, a really long time, maybe two or three years, I think, where it's just going to be underground. It's not, not a lot of people are going to know about it. People are still going to keep using eBay for a really long time. And that's going to stick around because people are used to it and it's the established bidding marketplace and stuff. But like eventually word is going to start getting out that like, Oh, there's this, there's this marketplace where, uh, there's there's practically no fees on what is sold and it, it, you know no it's taxes great, no sales tax yeah yeah it's a great proposition for sellers mainly who who constantly get screwed over by eBay's really regulated system and then PayPal also works in in that as well by taking taking fees out so um just like Bitcoin, just like Bitcoin took was so under the radar for for several several years, and then people started finding out about it. It's at first it was just underground, but now like Bitcoin is actually a fairly mainstream uh, topic at the very least. Maybe not a lot of people own it, but most people have heard about it at this point and have some sort of opinion or belief about it. They've maybe read an article or two about it. Uh, so even Bitcoin right now is still kind of in an underground phase, and then once Open Bazaar gets successful, it's also going to be uh, right. underground for a while. Actually, I, I'm I made the the sales tax comment like jokingly, but that if the internet sales tax uh, passes that everyone's talking about, if that happens, that would actually be a huge selling point for Open Bazaar. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. The the thing with that is though the reason they haven't really passed a sales tax on the internet yet and there's just been discussion discussion is how are you really going to implement that and force websites to do that you know follow that sales tax like you can make a law about it but like you know eBay is probably opposed to that policy they don't want to increase fees for their users just for the benefit of the state so like users are against that major websites are against that 
And even if they were to implement it, there's no really real way you can enforce an internet sales tax. The internet is the most free, you know, place that's ever been invented, in my opinion. I think there might actually be some states that do have an internet sales tax because I've there's been there's been a couple of websites that I've bought that sales tax on. I think I think actually um, Overstock might be one of them. I think I pay I think you pay sales tax on Overstock, and but is I it bought, an internet sales tax or is it just the regular like state just, sales tax? I really don't know. It just says tax on the ba- oh. on the uh, receipt. And I bought a book from a rare bookstore in New Jersey. I bought it online. They shipped it over, and, and I had to pay, uh, I think it was New Jersey sales tax. I'm not sure. I had to pay some kind of sales tax. Um, and that's that's happened. I've run into that a few times. I don't I don't know if the, maybe the websites might be voluntarily doing it or if those states do have some kind of online sales tax. Mm-hmm. But it's definitely it's definitely there already. I can see it happening if the federal law gets passed. I can see it happening in some capacity. But like you said, like you said, if if the people if the people running online businesses don't want to implement it, they don't have to. They who's going to stop them? How how are you going to enforce such a broad, massive law? You you can't. You really can't do it. It's kind of like it's kind of like the barter tax that nobody knows about. You have to. You have to I've pay tax. Yeah, you have to pay. Technically, you're supposed to be paying taxes on anything you barter. Like, if you if you trade something and the market value for the thing you got is higher than the market value for the thing you traded, you have to pay tax on the difference. Who does that? Nobody does that. Yeah. I I kind of see it being sort of like that. Yeah, and then, like, once Open Bazaar is up and running. Even if somehow some kind of stupid internet tax or even state taxes, all kinds of taxes, it's all irrelevant. Uh, like people, the legal system is still going to expect people to report their earnings that they make, even on Open Bazaar, just like the IRS expects people to report their capital gains on Bitcoin value fluctuation profits. So, so ridiculous. Yeah, so they're gonna they're gonna try and get people to basically opt in to the tax system and be like. Um, if you're making a lot of money there, then I guess you kind of have a reason to be paranoid. I mean, you will probably want to report your earnings, but it won't. It'll it'll be harder for uh, the government to go after these people, definitely. Especially especially once Open Bazaar is fully anonymous, fully connected with Tor, uh, you basically won't be able to track people. And then if you if you launder your coins by putting them through a coin mixer. Um, you know, you're basically in the clear. Use Dark Wallet. Use Dark Wallet, yeah, which is also coming up. That's in the mm-hmm. Alpha 7, or maybe Alpha 9 right now. I'm not sure. I think it is Alpha 9. But, so. but yeah, Dark Wallet will be, hopefully it will be much safer than a than a deep web coin mixer. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, so definitely. Like, so, um, yeah. You know, decentralized solutions yeah, constantly that's what being it, made. It's, it's all it's all about getting around the government. I mean the government just ruins everyone's parade. Everyone's having all this fun being friends with everybody and government <laughs> says, happy No, you're bad. Lives. Yeah. You're actually hurting everyone. Yeah, transacting doing what you freely. Want, being happy. So that's what decentralization is all about. You know, maybe decentralization wouldn't happen if the government had just stayed out of the way and then they you know they maybe they wouldn't be irrelevant. But too yeah. bad they decided to abuse their power, so this is what's happening now. They're going to have to deal with it. Yeah, deal with it, government. <laughs> hey, you, you know, they're just going to keep taking down the darknet markets that are the low-hanging fruit, the stupid people who register servers with their real name. And they're, I, I'm telling you, there's probably still going to pe- be people doing that even when Open Bazaar is up and running and fully functional and reliable. Like, there's still going to be people who are like, wow, um, I'm going to set up my own marketplace on a server or do do what whatever the government thinks is 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 wrong, and they're gonna go after those people because they're easy to track and easy to take down. Then the government can put that person's head on a stake, metaphorically, not literally. Basically, what they do down with marijuana. Everybody knows. Anybody with common sense knows that these marijuana busts accomplish nothing. That the DEA does these huge drug dealer busts. Everybody knows. That anyone with common sense knows that they do nothing, but they. They still go after these people because, 
yeah, they want they want to put heads on pikes and use it for propaganda. We actually accomplished something. Yeah, these people now, are so dangerous, and we took them off the streets. Aren't you glad that we over that we rule you? <laughs> well, yeah, but no, you didn't. For every dark night, you take down thirty more will pop up, um, and you keep taking them. Start using open bazaar, which you can't take down. So yeah. good luck with that. The people are adapting. We're a very adaptable populace who uh, can, you know, create solutions that go around these threats that this outside entity is is placing onto the general public at large and and onto markets. So just adapt and and keep doing business as usual. Keep building the economy, the digital economy, as it's meant to be. And, you know, how it's meant to empower people to transact freely, have more control over their finances, you know, the whole the whole digital currency thing. Uh, it's all about empowering people and giving them more options. You don't have to trust Wall Street anymore to, you know, do your finances. You know, I mean, this goes back to Bitcoin's uh, inception in 2009, basically as a response to the horrible, horrible financial crisis that happened in 2008, um, basically formed on, on Wall Street, and people are like, this is messed up, the government is bailing out these big banks with taxpayer money just because they took unnecessary risks, and they want to use capitalism for their gains, but they want to use socialism for their losses. That's exactly what it is. And Bitcoin is a is is a response yeah. to that in some ways. So now we're we're seeing the fruits of this uh, digital economy kind of sprout up, and pe most people don't even know about it yet. That there's this alternative economy trying to be, you know, built up from the ashes of the old financial system. If it wasn't for those stupid roads, we might not need government at all. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's yeah, that's different. That's a different <laughs> discussion. <laughs> um. But uh, let's let's move on to another story. Um, I want to mention this this really random uh, mobile game that kind of came out of nowhere and got really popular. It's only on the Apple App Store right now, and I'm waiting for an Android version. But it's called Bitcoin Billionaire, and it doesn't actually involve any actual Bitcoin. You don't have to you don't have to pay Bitcoin to play it, and you don't earn Bitcoin from it. But like apparently, it's kind of like 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 Temple Run, the old mobile game where you're running a guy. I think it's like that, and but you have to collect bitcoins on like a path or something. And um, it's it's like it's at number 16 um, on the iOS app market. So um, getting pretty popular. Yeah, cool that Bitcoin game is in high on the charts. But I don't understand the appeal of it. Maybe it's just because I'm not into mobile gaming at all, really. I don't play games on my phone. Mm -hmm. uh, I just don't get the game. I read a little bit about it. It says you like mine fake Bitcoins and you can use it to upgrade your house or whatever. And, or, or you can use it to buy upgrades so you can mine Bitcoins faster or whatever. But I don't know. I just don't, Do you, I don't get it. But, but like... Good for them, though. Yeah, if it, if it goes viral on the you know on the iPhone market, do you think that might create a little bit of like buying pressure? Do you think that's a bullish indicator if no. a, if a Bitcoin related game goes viral? No, I think that's a stretch. I I uh, I, I know what you're thinking about. I saw that thread on Bitcoin markets where the guy said, if it gets to number one, it's going to be a rally. There's not. It's uh -huh. it's a game. It has nothing to do with real Bitcoins. You don't have to buy Bitcoin to to play the game what it, i'm guessing I, i'm guessing what he's saying is that it, it'll get so popular that people will search bitcoin and be like what's bitcoin bitcoin billionaire and they'll google yeah. it yeah and they'll buy some i just don't i don't see that happen increase awareness it's kind of a little a stretch. bit it, it's kind of a stretch it, it'll of course people see the word bitcoin and they might be curious and they'll search it yeah uh but i doubt it'll drum up enough interest interest to actually uh put upward pressure on the price that's that's a stretch yeah all these people playing this mobile game and it's like wow i've collected six thousand bitcoins in this game now i'm gonna go buy a real bitcoin <laughs> uh -huh. yeah and, but if if they're playing how they're playing the game what what makes you think they're gonna put the game down to buy a bitcoin 
Uh-huh. And and by and by the time they get bored of the game, once they stop playing the game, they forget about bitcoins. Yeah, well, you know, I think that that argument is probably pretty spot on with what's going to happen. <laughs> Someone uh, commented on Reddit, this guy named Slow Moon. He commented on that thread about this Bitcoin billionaire game. He's like, why why do you expect a rally if it hits number one? Did people go out and buy crowbars after Half-Life became popular? <laughs> I saw that comment, and that was a perfect response. Yeah. Hey, man. I I did have a more positive perception of crowbars after playing Half Life. I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> I'm like that is that is a freaking useful tool if you ever have to fight off against um, interdimensional zombies. Aliens. What are those things called? Head crabs. Yeah, those yeah. things were so annoying. Yeah, head crabs and hitting them with crowbars. I mean, so yeah. like, if that ever happens, then you know to buy a crowbar because Half Life demonstrated that's how you deal with that. Forget guns. Get a crowbar. I don't know. I've I've played Half Life a few times, and I never bought a crowbar. All right, just wait though. You're more aware of them. Wait till <laughs> the. I actually, if I had the choice between using a gun and the crowbar, I used the gun. The only okay, the yeah. only time, the only time I used the crowbar, I would choose. Obviously, there's sometimes you have to where you have to break boards and stuff, but. Mm. If you're fighting like one single head crab and it moves so fast that it's like impossible on the on the 360 anyways you can move a little faster on PC but it's so it's so hard to like move your gun and hit them that I would just take the crowbar out and let them jump in my face then I would hit then I would hit them. Oh wow. But I actually I I played the first half or I tried to play the first Half-Life it was uh it was harder than I wanted it to be. I didn't want to put that much effort into it. <clears throat> but the crowbar actually was a lot more useful in the first Half-Life. Yeah. Did so. they kind of nerf it in the second one? Make it not uh, as good? They didn't, they didn't nerf it. They just made the enemies easier. Okay. Well, um, you know, back to the Bitcoin billionaire game. I just want to say, like, if the developer of that game happens to be listening to this right now, which is maybe a one in, one in a million chance, but or maybe I should just email him. But like, come on, make an Android version, man. Come on, I just I want to play it. I just want to try it out. I hear it's actually pretty fun and addicting. And someone actually someone said that it's like the Flappy Bird for Bitcoin. And I did like oh, Flappy God. Bird. I need to stay far away from Bitcoin billionaire then. <laughs> <laughs> Flappy Bird, you, the, you play that's, that. That's 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 how mobile games get me. I don't play mobile games. I rarely play any mobile games at all, but then there will be one that's just so addicting that it will consume my entire life for like three days, and then I'll never play it again. That's what happened with Flappy Bird. I I played it nonstop for a week, and then I never played it again. Well, if you play that nonstop <laughs> for a week or even just three days, like um, it can get really, really like frustrating. Yeah. Because it's it's so simple, but then at the same time, it's so frustrating when you when you lose yeah if if it does go on android i'll get it just because it's about bitcoin Mm -hmm. but i really don't understand the appeal but i guess it's cool that a bitcoin game is getting that popular yeah and like hopefully this kind of maybe inspires people to um create actual games that does involve bitcoin in you know maybe transacting with other players on the in the game or buying microtransactions for power-ups or extra in-game currency or whatever it is like those those are the real games that are going to be really interesting um to to try out and play because that's going to involve real money and um as i've mentioned before on the podcast I'm i'm a fan of um like not just not just like gambling with seals of clubs but like any game that kind of implements um currency in an innovative novel way and encourages people to you know pump actual wealth into into the system for playing with it in in a game so um pretty interesting stuff yeah uh moving on yeah uh i want to talk about this guy who implanted nfc chips into (laughs) his hands so he can transacting bitcoin wirelessly and and really without a device even just by waving his hand in front of like a register 
can now be able to pay in Bitcoin and also receive payments from people into into a cold wallet that's implanted into his hand. And he actually joked that, oh, it's not actually a cold wallet because my, my hands are 98 <laughs> yeah. degrees. Yeah. <laughs> so that's that's pretty that's pretty <laughs> crazy that, that someone actually injected a Bitcoin wallet into their body. This is possible. Somebody's got to be the first to do it, but my initial reaction was, what happens when NFC is obsolete? Mm -hmm. it, it's not even that widely used as it is, and it's been around for a while. So what happens when the next thing comes along that's way better and easier, and this guy just has microchips in his hands <laughs> that he probably spent a lot of money on? <laughs> yeah, I mean, hopefully you would just be able to... Uh, get them out somehow you know with it with a, some kind of other injection device but instead suck it out like i don't yeah. know how that medical procedure works <laughs> but or maybe he could just leave them in there for the rest of his life who knows maybe yeah, he'll, maybe he likes right. bitcoin so much where he's like even if this is becomes obsolete in the future when we're just transacting with google glass on our eyeballs or something like hey f you know screw it i i i have um nfc bitcoin chips in my hands and that's just how it is now <laughs> yeah what i what i thought was in the bitcoin wallet uh was the guy who the bitcoin wallet guy um the person who he bought the microchips from or the nfc chips from that guy actually has chips in his hands too uh but he doesn't use it for bitcoin he he put NFC locks on his doors, so he doesn't use keys or anything. He just reaches out to, for the doorknob and it automatically unlocks. I think that is really cool. That is awesome. Yeah. Yeah, I thought that was more interesting than the Bitcoin thing, even though the article uh, that we read was about Bitcoin. Yeah, <clears throat> but yeah. I, I was more interested in the in the keyless door locks than I was with the Bitcoin wallet in your hand. Well, that sounds that sounds like the most useful thing, like at, at this point in time, because you, still there's a lot of places that don't accept Bitcoin, and if you just wave your hands everywhere hoping to pay for all your stuff <laughs> <laughs> wirelessly with your hands, um, it's not gonna work. But if you got that like if you got that device and software installed onto your doorknob, like don't have to use keys anymore. And if it's installed into your car as well, don't have to use keys for your car. I know that there's there's and it, there are NFC keychains and stuff like that that exists for cars where, like, if the if the keychain is in your pocket, then you can open the door. Um, but, I, you know, the, the one that's in his hand is probably more secure because it has to be a closer distance to, to unlock it. Your hand is literally on the doorknob. Right. And so. it would be it would be really uh, a really messy job of stealing that key out of his hand. Uh, yeah. I think that would be I think that would be a deterrent for a lot of potential burglars. Oh yeah, that's a good point. That's a good point. Like if, if someone wants <laughs> to rob you and uh, break into your house or whatever, uh, they will have to do it over your cold dead hands. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and like, oh, you want you want the key? I'll give you the key right here. Pop right in the face. I think I think the NFC technology uh, more useful in that area than it will be with like. Uh, currency transactions mm -hmm. um, it's like you you know you have it on phones and it's cool that you can just like hold your phone up to somebody else's and get you know like a picture or a file or something but you can also do that just as easily over text messaging or email so i th i think i think more practical yeah. things like you know like locks and cars ignitions and things like that i think that's where nfc uh will really take off if it does take off and that's yeah. the that's where it seems to where it would be the coolest and uh, most uh, most innovative. What if you programmed it somehow to, uh, like, let's say you want someone to come over to your place, but uh, you want them to pay first for some reason. Like maybe they owe you money and you're like, hey, we can hang out, but you gotta pay me first. And they come and like, they can they can open the door only if they pay a certain amount of Bitcoin to a certain address. Yeah. Well, hey, make a smart contract on counterparty Ethereum, and uh, it it's connected to your hand chip. And once you once you send it to his wallet, and it gets into his wallet, uh, it gives you the private key to his uh, doorknob, and you go over to his house and walk in. <laughs> you pay the fee. 
you paid, you paid the toll. Welcome. <laughs> um, my my other my other thought about this is um, you ha- like I don't I don't know how familiar you are with the Bible, but. Not really. <laughs> Um, oh, I, well, I know where you, I know where you're going. With this, Revelations. I'm familiar with that part. Yeah. Mark of the Beast. Yeah. yeah. Do you like if this stuff gets popular? If these chips in bodies get popular for either paying for stuff or for unlocking doors, like are religious people going to freak out and say that this is the end of the world because people are getting the mark of the beast implanted in, in a chip uh, in under their skin? Probably, but I would have to say that they're stupid because um, Revelation says that the it'll be a government that does it uh, because the Antichrist will come as like, he'll pose as like a world leader to solve all the problems, the famine and uh, murderers and genocide that's happening. Um, and he'll come and solve all the problems. And he says, in order to solve the problem, you have to put the mark, you have to wear the mark of the beast and um, after that, I don't know what the Bible says about it, like what it does or what it signifies, but I'm guessing it, like it's a way to control your entire life and be evil to you and track yeah. you down and stuff. Um, yeah. Or is it just like exactly, a concern about government intrusion? Is it like a privacy matter? Um, it could be interpreted that way, but either way you interpret it, it is a uh, government leader. Um the Antichrist, the Satan, not Satan, but the Antichrist posing as, you know, this benevolent world leader who's going to take over a government, uh, you know. Um, I believe people exactly... said that about both uh, George Bush and Barack Obama. <laughs> no, they're they're not. Well, Barack Obama was the Antichrist, but uh, George Bush was a reptilian. He wasn't the Antichrist. Oh, okay. I see. Um, I see. But yeah, this, this Mark of the Beast thing in the Bible, not exactly the same thing as is buying um, a chip from a company that has no interest in your life other than you giving them money for the chip and then you using it for whatever the hell you want. Mm. Pretty different if you ask okay, me. Because, yeah, so. yeah. It, yeah, it's on the Bitcoin blockchain. It's decentralized. Yeah. So, okay. Don't don't worry, religious people. It's not happening yet. <laughs> not Just yet. Wait until President Hillary Clinton mandates that <laughs> everyone gets RFID chips implanted then you can start, you know, screaming about the Antichrist. Isn't and... there isn't there a rumor that that was one of the like hidden stipulations of Obamacare? Uh, there was the death panels, obviously, but then I I, was, I remember hearing something about um, there there was a stipulation that nobody it was on the it was on the down low. All the politicians were hush hush about it, but you had to get an RFID chip. To that would carry all your information, your uh, insurance information. Yeah, that rumor was out there, and and back then people were screaming about the market yeah. beast too. It's six six six. It's happening. <laughs> Obama. This is proof. He's the antichrist. Oh uh, yeah. yeah, fun times. Um, so um, let's move on to the next topic. Uh, I I want to mention this guy, Brian Kelly. He's a contributor at cnbc and it appears that he has actually written a book recently about bitcoin and he published a pretty good essay uh on his tumblr blog uh about bitcoin basically calling it the most important innovation in the history of money and he he said a lot of stuff that a lot of people in the bitcoin community are these they're already familiar with these arguments you know bitcoin removes the middleman from the money system and that's a game changer in the financial world uh you know just executed with just thirty-one thousand lines of code so he he gets it he understands it and it's it's kind of a big deal that you know this guy is a contributor at at a major financial news network and he's basically a full-on bitcoin convert uh evangelist and um pretty pretty good i recommend uh everyone go in and read it just to kind of soak in the fact that like there's evangelists on on major news networks now who who believe in this and who are providing coverage to it this this essay actually got um posted on yahoo finance as well so getting some information and exposure out there and and starting to help people kind of like people who were skeptical before kind of maybe see oh maybe this thing isn't a total scam maybe this thing isn't a ponzi scheme maybe you can actually do real 
innovations on this platform and the fact that you know he makes a really good analogy which is one of my favorite analogies is that bitcoin does to the financial middlemen what email did to the po u.s post office so that's a pretty good way to put it and he basically gets it he actually wrote a whole book and i'm considering um buying the book so i can check this out and see you know how good this guy gets it and if he has any you know new ideas to propose to the system like we smart contracts like there's all kinds of financial instruments that are possible with smart contracts that weren't even possible on Wall Street before, and it's all decentralized. So, yeah. I'm, re I'm really glad that people on mainstream news media are starting to become convinced of it, and they're starting to spread or communicate the benefits of it to people who otherwise would never even uh, hear of Bitcoin. Uh, like, like a few months ago, um, I was watching Fox Business, and they were talking about, I don't even remember what they were talking about now, but it was it was not about Bitcoin. That's what made this really surprising to me, because it had nothing to do with Bitcoin, but this guy just randomly said, well, that wouldn't be possible in a Bitcoin economy. And I was like, did, did that just, oh, wow. he just mentioned Bitcoin in passing, like it was a casual thing that everyone knows about on Fox Business? And that was, so I'm glad there's more people like that. Um, I'm glad this Brian Kelly guy is, is, has become convinced but you know me I have to rain on everyone's parade he didn't Brilliant. really say any he didn't really say anything original in his article but except for is, maybe the milk analogy I don't know if anyone thought of that before stupid it, to be honest that was pretty stupid but um but yeah I have to rain on everyone's parade he didn't say anything original uh, nothing I've never read before or heard seen on a video but yeah, he knows it's big. Course, he probably he probably owns some Bitcoin. He owns a few Bitcoins. And but but to be fair, his his purpose in writing that article wasn't to you know contribute some original idea. He's just broadcasting it to the mainstream, which is and promoting don't, his book don't, at the same time. Um, don't listen to my eternal pessimism. It's what what this guy is doing is is extremely positive. Uh huh. Yeah, I just I want to spell out the the milk thing that he came up with because this is this is one of the only things that people really criticize this article for. Um, commenters on Reddit criticized it, but like he says that oh, with smart money like Bitcoin, you can program the entire transact transaction into your carton of milk. When the milk is running low, a message is sent to your grocery store to deliver more milk. Along with this message is a payment in Bitcoin. When you arrive home, your milk is waiting for you and has already been paid for. Just try doing that with a piece of paper. <sighs> okay, he's right that you can't do that with paper fiat money, but actually you could implement something like that uh, using just credit cards, really. Because just get the technology that senses how much milk is left and program that to order the milk from the store using a, using a credit card or any digital from a PayPal, whatever it is, and you can do that. It doesn't have to be Bitcoin. Um, but he's on the right track. He's on the right track. Uh, he knows that there's innovative <coughs> things that are going to come out of this system. He's just kind of he's just kind of beating around the bush a little bit with the milk analogy. I was really amazed, actually. People on Reddit seemed really offended by that milk thing. And, and <laughs> yeah. in-depth responses about how you could set that up with a credit card. I was... I was more, um, I was more off offended's not the right word, but I was more focused on the fact that I didn't really contribute anything new to the Bitcoin discussion than mm. the fact that the milk thing was a really bad idea. But like I said, that wasn't this article's intent. I just have to find one negative thing about every single thing I look at. I don't know why. I just have hey, it's to. Good, it's good to provide and, constructive criticism. And 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 that was the negative thing I saw in this article. But it's, I think it's crazy that um, there are people in mainstream positions like uh, Brian Kelly, who are spreading awareness about Bitcoin using their mainstream uh, channels to spread awareness about Bitcoin. Yeah, and he's not the only one either. Um, like Wall Street Journal actually has um, some contributors who cover digital currency on a regular basis and new developments there. I think yeah. uh, Paul Vigna is one of the people doing that for Wall Street Journal. So 
I mean, really, any any financial network or publication worth its salt has to pay attention to Bitcoin and digital currency at this point because it's so relevant and it's becoming more relevant basically every week and especially every month, every every year. This thing has a greater and greater impact, whether it's Bitcoin or Ethereum uh, or you know open bazaar markets or just the, the Winklevoss ETF is opening soon on NASDAQ. So all this thing is, is making it more reli- um, more legitimate. I was going to say religious, but it's <laughs> some Bitcoiners do have a religious well, attachment. I mean, <laughs> they, they are called evangelists for a reason. Yes, yes. Um, and, you know, there's a little bit of shade of that in myself and, and in all of us kind of involved in this cryptocurrency space. But, yeah, like n- mainstream news outlets are having to pay more attention to it whether they like it or not get get someone on your staff paying attention to this writing something about this uh every week because uh, people want to learn about it even if they're not buying into the system yet even if they're not um buying up bitcoin uh, people are curious about it they want to learn about it and usually it starts off with oh this thing is a ponzi scheme it's a, it's a scam but eventually as they learn more whether through articles or through good old-fashioned internet research, they begin to realize that it's an actual um, decentralized, reliable system that has no central middleman to basically handle people's money between each other. It does take away the middleman, and yeah, it's 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 a huge deal, and people are beginning to realize that. It's definitely exciting, and I hope wanted to go mainstream too soon because i want to get a pretty decent hoard accumulated and then then i wanted to go mainstream so i could be rich yeah just hold off on the mainstreamness just (laughs) i i just want to i just want to point out something i noticed um because you mentioned his book briefly Mm -hmm. kind of a bummer um on this tumblr page at least the only link to his book is on amazon so just going off this Tumblr page, there's no way to buy his Bitcoin book with Bitcoin, which is kind of a bummer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I I feel like yeah, I agree. Anyone who is selling a product related to Bitcoin, whether it's a a book or art, you know, there's artists who draw Bitcoin related, uh, you know, pieces, you know, pictures and painting and stuff, should accept Bitcoin for it and. Like, even if it is on Amazon, I guess you could kind of work around that if you really wanted to pay in Bitcoin. Go to gift.com, buy an Amazon gift card that's a little bit over the amount of the book, and then use the gift card code to go buy the book. So yeah. in that case, you're kind of using gift as a, gift.com as a, as a middleman so that you can basically, within, you know, you can do this process within 10 minutes, just exchange your Bitcoin for that book, and it'll get delivered to you, so... Uh, Amazon doesn't accept Bitcoin directly yet. There's been petitions to try and convince Amazon to accept Bitcoin. And I think one of them recently reached like 5,000 signatures trying to convince Amazon to accept Bitcoin. And I think it's going to happen eventually. It's just a matter of time. Um, But yeah, Um, I'm considering reading that book and and checking it out and buying it with Bitcoin through Gift. And I... I just checked on Overstock, by the way, and it's not the book isn't available on Overstock, so okay. that's a bummer. Come on, Brian, set up a website or somewhere we can buy Bitcoin. So, yeah, yeah. I guess know, his his main floor. audience is the Bitcoin community. Those are the people who are probably yeah. most likely to buy the book and see what he knows. And so, you know, hey, you want their money too, right? Sell it on Open Bazaar. There you go. There you go. <laughs> hey, sell it digitally on Open Bazaar. Sell the yeah. Sell the EPUB file or whatever your favorite ebook format is. Sell it, sell it for like sell it for ten bucks on Open Bazaar, and I would buy that in a heartbeat. I think it's like fifteen bucks on Amazon or something. But selling for ten dollars for the digital copy that I can put in my Kindle through a decentralized marketplace—that's the glorious digital future economy that I want to live in. I personally like real books better, though. Oh, oh okay, you, you old person. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I can't, I can, I can't read long things on a screen for some reason. I don't know. It makes my eyes tired. Um, well, you know, with and, the Kindle, 
at least with the Kindle that I have from like three years ago, it's not even a real screen. It's more like an etch a sketch than a screen. Just yeah. an etch a sketch with super high resolution, so you can read everything clearly. But there's like no screen brightness or anything. You really and need I, like an, a am, reading light above you at the same time. I, I am an old. Person. I do. I also just like, like having books. Like um, I don't know. Sean actually cut this, but right now from just the raw video, you can see my bookshelf in the corner, and it's got a bunch of old books on it. I just, yeah. I just like, I just like how books look on the shelf. I, I like reading books with paper. And mm. I've, I don't know, I've, I've never bought an ebook that wasn't for school. So. Yeah, I, I've got a small bookshelf <laughs> as well over in my corner, but it's mostly taken up by Harry Potter books. Oh, I have another one with all my Harry Potter books that oh, okay. you can't see, but yeah, it's, nice. it's on the other side of the room. Yeah, yeah, those things take up a lot of space. Now that was like, come on, <laughs> that's that's like a thirty kilobyte file right there in a freaking ebook. Yeah, Harry Potter is is big. But anyway, <laughs> yeah. Um, maybe in the future we'll be able to pay for J.K. Rowling's new story with Bitcoin. Yeah, hopefully. Yeah. I I want to buy the movie ticket to the new uh, movie about Newt Scalamander with Bitcoin. This is a movie about Newt Scalamander. Yeah, fan, uh, it's. You know, you know the book, the textbook in the story called Fantastical Beasts and Where to Find Them? Yeah, yeah, I have that. Yeah, it's, yeah, I have it too. And it, it's, yeah, they're making a movie. Warner Brothers is making a movie about the author of that book and the adventures he went on while he's writing that book. Oh, wow, I didn't know that. That's pretty yep. awesome. Yeah, it's actually called Fantastical Beasts and Where to Find Them. J.K. Rowling wrote the screenplay for it. Wow. And Warner Brothers is uh, producing it or publishing it, whatever. So wow, very nice. It's going to be two or three part series. So wow, expand that, expand that yep. shit. Yeah. All right, well, uh, guys, thanks for listening. This has been your Harry Potter podcast. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, yeah, uh, thanks for listening, guys, to the Coin Brief podcast. We've pretty much covered um, a pretty pretty good assortment of stories. Um, uh, please uh, like our video, uh, subscribe, comment uh, with your with your own analysis that probably kicks our analysis in the butt. Um, and also, uh, we, we've set up uh, a donation address specifically for the podcast. I'm going to try and arrange that somewhere onto the onto the screen for this. Um, uh, all all funds donated to that will be used to upgrade like equipment for the podcast and stuff like that. At some point, maybe we'll be able to get Evan um, a high-quality like microphone, maybe even like a Turtle Beach or something. I need one. And um, yeah, so if you if you like us and want to support us financially directly with cryptocurrency, of course you can always tip uh, the YouTube channel itself with Change Tip, which is freaking an awesome platform. Or you can tip each of us individually with Change Tip um, via Twitter. But if you if you want to even go around Change Tip and support us directly with crypto, um, that option is available now. So, uh, yeah, thanks guys for listening to the Coin Brief podcast, episode number twenty three. This is your open source for digital currency news, and we'll see you guys next week. Thanks for listening. <laughs>